a very long time sometimes. Oh, look at that. When I hit go live, it says excellent connection. It went from no data to excellent connection. There you go. Instantly, just by clicking a button. That's how it works. This is how you live stream, people. <laughs> All right. Uh, my, there we go. Okay. It is working for me. How about that? Magic. It does work sometimes. Is that a weird sound? <laughs> Hi, Carol. Oh, good. Carol is here because I got a pen-related thing. <laughs> of course. Of course. I think I maybe mentioned this, but uh, today is December 1st, so I have opened day one of my Diamine Inkvent Advent Calendar. <laughs> okay. And uh, it's, are you familiar with, with this? Yeah, you were telling me a little bit about it last time. So how's the ink? Right? I 25? I yeah, I haven't unsealed it yet. It is the, it's it's called Bliss. Okay. And uh, it's been a crazy day, so I haven't been able to like, I'm, I'm assuming there's a website somewhere that tells you like what it is. Because some pens you're like not supposed to put shimmer inks in and there are shimmer inks in here. <laughs> so uh, I haven't had time to do any of that yet though, so. Hopefully later today. Okay. So not live fun. on the show here today. No, sorry. <laughs> like I, hold up and rate. I don't, <laughs> I don't even know where I put it. <sighs> also, I'm a little bit mad at you, Joe Bulig. What did I do? You picked the longest book in the history of the universe. <laughs> I think this may be longer than Tate to think. <laughs> <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> it is possible. What is it? Four fifty? I don't have it with me right now. It's long. Yeah, tiny print. Yep. <laughs> I was not aware of this whenever I picked it. When I picked it, I think I saw the page count, which I think was just over four hundred. And in my head, I was like, okay, that's a long book. But we've done those a handful of times with really no issue. And then I got it and looked at it. It's like it's like a six hundred page book. Yeah, it's the longest book I've ever seen with the smallest print I've ever seen. No problem. I, I don't we'll see. Done, I don't though. see the issue here at all. <laughs> I think it'll be perfect. All right. <laughs> do we need to do like a two-parter? We could do like <laughs> we'll do the twenty-four laws first, and then we'll do the second twenty-four laws and split it across uh, two episodes. Uh. Part of me wants to do that, yeah, because this is going to be a hefty tome to finish. But yep, I feel like uh, from what I've heard about this book, it's very polarizing. I don't think you want to split this one. You just want to get it done. Get it over with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I I will admit that I suspect I'm not to this point yet. I suspect that by the time I'm done with it, I'm going to be on the edge of skimming instead yeah. of reading. Could be. And there's only been, I think, a couple books that I've done that with. I don't know. I can't place what those were. But I know that there's been at least two where I was, like, skimming the last chapter because I was just I was done. Couldn't do it anymore. Probably <laughs> books I picked would be my assumption. It's typically the way that goes. Joe picks the painful ones, it seems. <laughs> All right. Wait a second. You deleted some follow-up. Uh, they were duplicated. Oh, I don't know why that was. There was one that... So number one and number two were duplicated. So I got rid of them. I think. Unless I misunderstood them. Can I undo? Notion's almost live. But if you both try to edit, there be dragons. <laughs> Yep. All right, should we make a podcast? Maybe. That thing over there just went red, which it shouldn't do. Yeah, you just got jaggy. Hmm. All right, let me go check it quick. Red is bad. YouTube is frozen.
Joe is gone. Is that any better? Yes. Okay. I hear from people that we're back, but it seems like there's a significant delay here now. I yeah. don't know why that is, but probably because I stopped it and then turned it back on just because every once in a while, people who run OBS a lot know this, but when you first start a stream, usually you want to run it for about 10 minutes before you start actually going live. Okay. And I normally start at close to 30 minutes to where it's actually streaming for like 30 minutes before we go live. Um, but they did a fire alarm here, fire drill, and I couldn't huh. do that this time. And sometimes when you first start it, it like gets a runaway bandwidth issue. Mm -hmm. So if you run it for a little bit, it gets past that, and then you're fine. But okay. we should be good. So when it gets runaway bandwidth, then it like degrades zoom and stuff, which means I get grainy to you too. <laughs> so hopefully we should be good from here on. Looks good. I think, uh, yeah. Okay. So we were about to count down, I think, right? Or was there anything we needed to go over first? Nope. I think I'm good whenever you are, sir. All right. Let's push buttons. Three. Two, one. All right, now I blanked on how I was going to start the episode. Perfect. That means I'm ready first. I got distracted when you uh, disappeared. Oh, I know. So happy Thanksgiving, Joe Bielig. Thanks. Happy Thanksgiving to you, too. What... Uh, what do you do to celebrate Thanksgiving? What sort of traditions? What sort of uh, meat do you cook and partake of? The only meat that is allowed on Thanksgiving is turkey. Unless my parents get a wild hair and decide to do something different. Which they didn't do this year. But normally we go down to Missouri, visit my mom for a little while, then we go visit my dad for a little while. Make fun of both of them while we're there, and then we come home. Super fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that because it's always, uh, like, and it's different in both realms, right? So my mom and stepdad don't like to do DIY projects, but we do them all the time. So I make fun of, you know, your clock isn't set correctly because the time changed and you haven't fixed it yet. So it's an annual tradition that Joe comes and fixes the clocks at my mom's house. Like, that's just how it goes. So, of course, I have to make fun of him for that. <laughs> Okay, that's that's legitimate. I thought you just like showed up, hurled some insults, and then left. <laughs> Sometimes it feels that way, but not this time. Okay. <laughs> we uh, had an interesting Thanksgiving, okay. and uh, we typically have turkey. Uh, we sort of had two Thanksgivings, however. The day of Thanksgiving was a little bit hectic. Okay. Um, my brother had some health issues. I actually ended up going into the hospital for a collapsed lung, but he's doing a lot better. He's home already and making a quick recovery. So fortunately, uh, everything is uh, looking good there. But that, that set us back a little bit. So we uh feels like the, the main Thanksgiving happened on Friday where we had brisket instead of turkey. And it was amazing. Five stars would definitely recommend brisket for Thanksgiving. Awesome. Or any holiday, really. Awesome. We had one year where we did seafood. At my dad's anyway. So, but I don't know. Turkey's kind of the thing that I feel like t it like turkey is Thanksgiving. That's but I'm I'm very traditional in that sense. So, I know that people do other things. It's just not my not my cup of tea. <laughs> well, if you're going to replace turkey with something, I can recommend brisket. Okay. Good to know. I'll I'll uh I'll Stick that one in my back pocket, and brisket will be on the menu if turkeys are ever not available. Do you ever do any sort of, like, smoking or anything? Yeah. At your, uh, Recently, okay. I've been starting to do that, yeah. All right. So what, do you, what have you done? What's your favorite? 
Uh, honestly, this is going to sound weird. One of my favorites so far is mac and cheese, <laughs> which you would not expect. But no. put together some mac and cheese, put it in the smoker for a couple hours, and that is some amazing mac and cheese. Interesting. You wouldn't guess that, but that's that's my favorite so far. Well, now that you've said it, I can kind of I, I can kind of see it. But yeah. Yeah, I never would have predicted that. <laughs> nope, definitely an oddball thing for sure. All right. Well, uh, shall we do some follow up? I suppose, if we must. Right. Have you been exercising in the morning? I have. It's really annoying for the rest of my family, though, because by the time they get out of bed and they're ready for breakfast, Joe's like hyper. <laughs> and I thought you were going to say that you were waking them up when you were picking things nope. up and putting things down. <laughs> nope. Nope, not at all. But that's partially because when we remodeled our house, I put insulation between the second floor and the first floor. That way <laughs> you can have entire groups of people over downstairs and not wake people up when they're upstairs sleeping. So... I wanted nice. the house to be able to handle that. So it does, I found out, which is good. So that said, I've been exercising in the mornings. Uh, the week of Thanksgiving was a challenge, though. <laughs> yes. So that one was difficult. But what I found was that I was able to kind of short circuit that process a little bit in that I convinced people to go on walks with me through the neighborhoods, which worked out well. Uh, so we were able to do like 30 and 40 minute walks just because everybody's standing around not knowing what to do. So it's like, hey, let's go do something instead of just standing here not knowing what to do. So that worked out well. So I was able to continue kind of that. It wasn't really in the mornings, like early, early mornings, but it was still in the morning for the most part. So uh, I'm going to continue this trend because this week I've been doing it every morning. Yeah, I do the hit workouts. So like the 20 minutes, you know, 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off repeatedly for 20 minutes. Uh, definitely gets your heart rate going pretty quick. Training. <laughs> Do what? High intensity interval training. Yes. Yeah. So those are fun. But that's what I've been doing. And so far, I can't say I'm like, you know, super strong man, but better than I have been. I'll say that. It's only a weekend, so it can't be that great. All right. What about no phone before breakfast? That one I'm pretty good at. Has that uh, <laughs> been supplemented by the exercise in the morning? Like, does that make it easier? I know that it, we're going to talk about this a little bit today, but I've kind of shifted the way that I think about it. So it's more like when I process a morning routine, I've typically thought of like, okay, this is 10 minutes long. This is four minutes long. Like I've, I've thought that way. Like here's how much time I've got, I'm giving myself to do that. Uh, again, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but whenever I've been doing that, it's more of a, let me get up, use the restroom, going to go do my workout. And then once I've done that, I'm going to grab a shower, go get breakfast. And by the time I've done all of that, the kids are up or getting close to getting up and I'm either sitting with a book over breakfast, and by the time I'm done with all of that, it's time to go to work, so that I don't really have time to grab the phone and run through things, so I haven't even had a chance to pick it up really until I get to work, which is roughly 8 o'clock, and I'm up at like 5.30. So it ends up being like two and a half hours that I'm going without my phone in the morning, which previous Joe would have freaked out over that concept, <laughs> but so far it's been fine. So I'm, I'm glad for the change in that routine. Uh, but having no phone before breakfast means that I'm set up better for the day, I find, just because I'm not seeing everybody angry about what Elon Musk is doing with Twitter today until <laughs> I'm past that point. So <laughs> like, okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. So anyway, absolutely love this routine. I would say if anybody's considering doing this, absolutely please do it because it's huge. Cool. So since you brought up Elon Musk, I don't want to go too far down here, but I'm <laughs> curious, are you, are you interested at all in Mastodon? Uh, so you, I, you may not know this, but I've had a ma my own Mastodon server for a long time now. Um, I, no, I did not know that. I do so, have a Mastodon account that I set up in like 2017, but I haven't okay. touched it. I'm not 
intending to leave Twitter for Mastodon. Yeah. I use Twitter very, for very specific purposes, none of which is connecting with the people that I really care about. Sure. <laughs> yep. I, I will say this. If you want to follow me on Mastodon and make sure that you don't miss anything that I post on Twitter, you can absolutely do that 100% without having to check Twitter because it all is the same. You can do the same thing on Tumblr. You can do the same thing on Reddit. Yeah, you built that into your website, didn't you? Yeah, so all of my posts, I post to my website, and then it goes everywhere from there. So if you want to follow me on Mastodon, it's great. It's Joe Bulig at joebulig.com. Like, that's all it is. <laughs> So you can find me there, but it's the exact same thing that goes to Twitter. I I just syndicate it to a whole bunch of different places. That way people don't have to choose. Just pick whichever one you want, and it's all the same. Of course, you would have your own Mastodon server. Yep. I don't know why I didn't think about that. It's <laughs> absolutely the way it should be. <laughs> I didn't want some wow. weird, like, Joe Bulig at Mastodon dot something else or some other yeah. place. I was like, I'd rather just own it and have a single user set up and be done. Yeah, Mastodon.social seems to be the one that people are trying to get into, but I heard that they just stop signups because every single Mastodon in instance has to be run by somebody somewhere. Correct. Yep. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that whole model makes no sense. To me. <laughs> Once you understand it, it makes sense, but trying to understand it is not a simple process. Like, I. Which is why it will never replace I, I think that it's going to be the nerds who do server stuff like I do that get the infrastructure up and running and then keep it up and running. Kind of like the open source thing. I mean, that's the model behind it, right? But I don't know that it's going to... I don't know that it is a... It's not a true replacement of Twitter. I'll say that. It, sure. It's just very different as far as like the community and the feel of it. So just know it's kind of like Twitter from 15 years ago, it feels like. Twitter even around Open 15 years ago. Social networking. <laughs> you yep. know exactly who's hanging out there. Oh not. yeah. Yep. <laughs> Correct. Yep. You know who you're getting or get seeing a conversation with when you go there. <laughs> For right. sure. Uh, you have one other action item here for follow up: the evening tea and book instead of screens. How's this going? Uh, it's hit or miss. More hit than miss, which is solid. Uh, so the routine has shifted a little bit for me. Historically, I would, I, I would get the kids to bed at night, and then I would come downstairs, grab my computer, and either do some writing for myself, or write some code for myself, or a client, or do a video project that I've got on contract, or something along those lines. So it would typically be something like that. I would go work on something for maybe an hour, hour, 15 minutes, then I'd get myself ready for bed, go to bed and I would fall asleep pretty quick, but I started like trying to keep track of how good is my sleep. And I did this kind of as an experiment to begin with. So instead of that whole routine and just explained, I'll get the kids to bed and then I'll come downstairs and brew some tea, grab either my bookworm book or some other book that I'm in the middle of, which at the moment is Dickens, sorry, Mike. And I will read for maybe an hour, and then I'll go to bed. And just the sleep tracking stuff has shown me that my sleep is significantly better that way. Even though technically nothing has changed time-wise, it's purely the actions beforehand. So I don't know. It's strange in the sense of it shouldn't matter, but it does. And because it does, I'm going to continue doing this. And... I like the effects of it. I fall asleep in about 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 the same amount of time, but I'm waking up a little bit earlier because I think the sleep that I'm getting is much better. So, sure. Overall, what, 10 out of 10, highly recommend. What tea are you drinking? Oh, that's um it's a whole mix of stuff. So, what was the one I had last night? There was one I'm not even going to think of it. It's like a chamomile that's something. A I'm going to recommend something for you, though. Okay. And that is bedtime tea. Bedtime tea. Well, there's all sorts yeah. of those. Which one? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll find out, and I'll put the link in the, the show notes, because there is a very specific one okay. that my wife and I have almost every night. So I'm really happy that this this particular action item is, is clicking for you. Sure. 
I do something similar almost every night and it's, it's awesome. I do think you're going to probably have to replace Dickens with the next book that you chose. I did actually swap that. (laughs) I think it was a couple, couple nights ago. I got to this one and I started diving into it. It It's like, Oh boy, what did I do? I had that thought and I knew you were going to bring it up. So, so I've, I've been reading gap books and I've been enjoying my gap books. And then today I'm like, I should probably order this one. And on Amazon, it wasn't going to get here till Monday. And I'm like, well, that's not that big a deal. Let me see how long. What? (laughs) (laughs) So I canceled my Amazon order, went and picked it up at the local Barnes and Noble. And uh, yeah, this one's going to take a while. Yep. My apologies to those who are reading along, but this will be a good challenge for you. It will. And me. We'll (laughs) We'll get it done. It's okay. So, right, so at this I, point, I have to continue the evening tea just to be able to get through the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to read for a while and then have the bedtime tea and then read some more. Yes. So because we're talking about bedtimes, I know you've got one here. Have you been getting yourself into bed by 10 o'clock? Uh, no. Uh, I So these these two action items are related. The The real action that I want to have happen is I want to be able to get up earlier and I am inching forward in this direction. However, we spent all of last week up in door County. I was working for the first three days of the week. uh, And then the rest of my family came up for Thanksgiving. Uh, Every time we go up there though, it is a, uh, especially outside of the tourist season in, in door County, it is pretty chill. And so pretty much anytime I get up there, I sleep a ton. (laughs) So for a while I was doing better going to bed earlier, but I was still like, I don't know. I sleep eight hours a night, but somehow it's like I have a bunch of sleep to catch up on. I don't know. So I was getting up actually even later. Uh, That has been pushing forward though. The last couple of days I had an early meeting yesterday, so I had to get up earlier, but uh, still not at my target time of, 6 a.m. I do have support from the rest of the household in this goal, though. So yeah, yep. <laughs> I do think it's it's going to get there. Just weird timing for me to actually make progress on this one. What time does the rest of your family get up in the morning? Does that make a big difference? Um, I don't know. We for a long time we've had this uh, okay to wake alarm clock it's called for the kids we have one of those turns green yeah so we've we've trained our kids not to get up before seven some of the younger ones would get up at six with me if they if they could but also they like to try to push and extend their their bedtimes we've got a a couple of well one teenager and one almost teenager um so they like to stay up later than my wife and i if, if we would let them uh, so we basically start bedtime at like 7.30, trying to get Adelaide in bed. And then like the next one goes to bed uh, by 8.30, then 9. And then so like bedtime is just becoming this, it's consuming our entire evening. And then lately <laughs> our youngest has been getting up in the middle of the night. And that just throws off everything. <laughs> yep. So I guess what I'm saying is pray for us. <laughs> Okay. All right, Mike. <laughs> Writing down. <laughs> uh, bedtime is exhausting with five kids who don't want to go to bed, but mm-hmm. we're we're getting there. Yeah, for a little while, this only lasted about a week because the point was made. But the okay to wake, right? So you set the quote unquote alarm, but it doesn't set off an alarm; it just turns green, which right. means the yeah. kids can sleep longer if they're tired. But if they wake up and see that it's green, they're allowed to get up. And I just started telling them, like, that's fine. Take as long as you want to get ready for bed. Any Every five minutes past 7.30, because our kids go to bed at 7.30, any five minutes past 7.30 that it takes you to get in bed, I'm moving that back five minutes. <laughs> like, So the longer you're up tonight, the longer you have to stay in bed in the morning. And I think there was uh, one night they pushed it pretty hard to like eight o'clock, but then they were just laying in bed for like an hour the next morning and could not. <laughs> they did not like that at all. So See that, that that's a lot of reprogramming. 
for yeah, us. Yeah, it is. It totally is. <laughs> yep. But I like that idea in theory. <laughs> yep. Again, it only lasted about a week, and then I don't think I've touched it or had an issue with it since. So yeah, maybe that drove the point home. I don't know, but I know that it's not an issue for us right now. So I'm sure that day's coming, though. <laughs> Lucky you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, let's get into today's book here, which is Mind Management, Not Time Management by David Cadavi. Uh, this is the guy who did the uh, Visual Zettelkast book, I believe. And uh, this was a recommendation. I should have looked up who recommended it. It might have been Carol, who's in the chat. So if it was you, Carol, thank you, because uh, this was a, an interesting read. And uh, the whole premise of this book uh, is encapsulated by the, the title, and it's broken down into seven different chapters. Uh, there really isn't... Uh, different parts, introduction, conclusion, whatever that's worth uh, expounding on here in the, the outline. So I think we'll take it chapter by chapter here today. Um, I, I'm kind of curious before we get into the specifics of the the chapter, what was your, uh, your frame of mind regarding time management going into this? I saw you had a tweet about how this was going to be your excuse not to, to time box. And I think you were kind of kind of joking, but I'm just kind of curious, you know, what were you thinking regarding time management as you picked up this book and was it in alignment with uh, your current way or what, what sort of broad changes to, to time management um, w have you made since then? I'm doing a bad job explaining this. Basically, was this book like a shock to your system when you picked it up? No, it wasn't. And, and just just for reference, like the tweet I put out was, did I just find an excuse to skip time blocking? Maybe that's clickbaity. I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But it, it's more that this is this is really getting around the mindsets behind creativity when we have a culture that's very time based, as in like tracking time or time blocking or this is what I'm going to do every day at this time or I have, it, it's probably not what I'm going to do every day at this time. It's more around I have an hour, what can I put in that hour and not considering the type of task you put in that hour, if that makes any logical sense to you at all. But that's that's ultimately, I think, the way that people in general think about it. I don't think about it that way and haven't for quite a time quite a while just because I know and I've said this for a long time that I cannot do like my my heavy coding projects or my heavy like writing stuff in the afternoon I just can't because my I just right. cannot focus on it I always do like the physical pulling cable setting up a stage configuring soundboards like I do the physical stuff in the afternoons just because I know that I can always focus on that no matter the time of day because it's physical movement when it's just sitting on the computer, I cannot do that in the afternoon. So coming from that mind frame, like that mindset into this book, uh, it's it's really more about giving a vocabulary around what's going on. That's that's kind of my view of how this turned out. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's kind of what I would have anticipated from you is that this was not a radical idea to either one of us. We were doing this in some way, shape or form already but i do uh, the reason i asked it <laughs> clumsily <laughs> was that i i think if you have a stereotypical view of productivity this could be a very radical idea and i think it is a very valuable idea it's absolutely worth unpacking and i'm kind of surprised that there are not more books that take this approach i feel like there's more being written probably the most popular ones that we've covered for bookworm are things like deep work by cal newport and essentialism by greg mckeown but i don't know i i feel like uh none of them have just put their finger on the problem the way that this one does <laughs> starting with the title yeah yeah <laughs> it's like no, but what you think about time management is wrong. You need a totally different paradigm in terms of 
how to be productive. Yeah. And, and deep work. And, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say at the same time, it, it's interesting how much of his, and I think we'll get into this in more detail. It's interesting to me how much of his explanation of how to manage your mind revolves managing time differently. And so it's not necessarily an anti-time management view, which is kind of the connotation with the title and kind of why I posed that question in my tweet the way I did. Did I find an excuse to stop time blocking? It's why I pitched it that way because it it's not what he's saying. He's not saying stop managing time. He's just saying change the way you're doing it, even though he does say not time management. Yeah. So that's probably the place we should jump off here with the uh, the first chapter, which is <laughs> the title of the book. Yep. <laughs> My Management, Not Time Management. Uh, that part was kind of weird, I thought, but whatever. I understand why he did it. This is uh, laying the foundation for all of the rest of the book, which is really about uh, managing your creative energy, maybe is another way of, of framing this. But couple specific things worth talking about in this uh, this first chapter. Uh, number one is that eventually there are limits with how you would try to become more efficient. And this was the first book that really spoke to the roots of a lot of the traditional approaches to, to time management, why we do it, stuff like that, which is Taylorism. Uh, is the name of this this uh, theory, I don't know, theory, but perspective introduced by Frederick Taylor, who in the 19th century used a stopwatch to identify the most efficient way to move a piece of iron across a yard. And basically, like, he's watching somebody do this. Okay, go, you know, and they do it a certain way. And then they, okay, put it back. Okay, go, and they do it a different way. <laughs> so he's figuring out the way to do the work that requires the least amount of effort and you can get done in the quickest amount of time. So then he teaches these prescribed movements to other workers in the Bethlehem steel yard. And by doing that productivity, quote unquote, quadrupled. So this scientific management for how you do your work or Taylorism was born thinking of time as the production unit. And so the belief here is that more time means more production. However, any production unit has its limits and there's a very interesting chart in here. We've all heard of the point of diminishing returns, right? So that's, if you've got your productivity on the Y axis and time management on the X axis, once you go past a certain number of hours, productivity does not continue to increase at the same rate. It kind of, if it's going up at like a 45 degree angle, you know, eventually it's, it's going to uh, become more flat in with the horizon. But what he's saying is that there is actually a point of negative returns beyond this point where if you continue to work, you're actually doing more harm than good. And anyone who has pulled an all nighter <laughs> trying to write a paper understands this <laughs> uh, but i think there's points of negative returns probably sooner these kick in sooner than we we realize a lot of times and just to follow up with this this taylorism concept isn't wrong i i just want to say that it's not wrong in the arena that frederick taylor was developing it yeah which is primarily in the physical actions realm so if you're doing, you know, I think of people like moving a lot of, I don't even know, wood chips with a shovel. Like you can adjust your stance and the way you hold a shovel and adjust your movements so that you can move that very efficiently and very quickly, which is exactly what Taylor was doing. That's the exact concept. And I would argue that's a very good thing to do because typically it means that you're not as hard on your body in the process. Problem is that that concept carried over into not the knowledge work world, which doesn't apply as well because it's too messy. It's not fluid movements. Your brain doesn't move the exact same way every single time, 
every time I sit down to write something, there's all sorts of background that is now changing the mind frame that I'm in whenever I sit down to write. And that's not the case when you're holding a shovel. It, it's just a different game altogether. So although Taylorism isn't valid, I would say, in most arenas today, I think it was valid at the time. We just haven't let it go yet. Well, it's valid in certain arenas, like you said, but I, I would argue even there, there is a, a point. I mean, the uh, the eight-hour workday, I forget what book we read that spoke to that. That was instituted around Henry Ford's time, right? Because of realizing that point of diminishing returns, it dropped significantly at eight hours for the average worker. That was not so that people could have work-life balance. It was so that they could achieve the maximum productivity yep. from the the workers that they were paying, <laughs> right? And so that idea is spoken to very strongly and directly in this first chapter, and I like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not just because I'm what I do classifies as knowledge work. I mean, he does talk about how you want to earn with your mind, not with your time. That's an idea attributed to Naval Ravikant. Uh, Ravikant? I don't know. They're kind of fun names. Yeah, they are very fun names. Page 26 talks about how time is apparently money when your boss is using it, yet somehow it's free time when it's left over for you to use. So there's a very top-down approach here to like uh, your employer owning your time. And I think like that should be pushed back against. Um, and really the rest of this book is, is sort of written for the, the knowledge worker. Cause that's how that's David Cadavi's role. He's, he's a writer. And so there's a lot of personal story in here, which maybe we'll get, get into. I didn't jot a whole lot of that down in my, my mind node, but uh, there is uh, some pretty, pretty crazy uh, story in here, especially in the, the last chapter. But uh, this whole idea of mind management, if you're trying to be productive in, in the creative realm, this is the thing you need to pay attention to because spending eight hours on writing doesn't mean that you are going to produce a quality writing. Mind management is about, the, about optimizing the resource of your creative energy. You can't connect the quality of an idea with the time that you you spend on them and that i completely agree with we kind of talked about some of that stuff with the, the laws of creativity by by joey cafone uh, and i feel like this book is a very good complement to that one uh, this is much less tactical i would argue this is kind of the why behind it uh, but in this this first chapter here he does a really good job i feel of just laying the case for why you should care about this stuff which is primarily just showing why, you know, one of the next chapters, there's, uh, he's got it titled Time Worship, not chapters, subtitles. Yeah. I got yep. confused by that a little bit. But, you know, we really do borderline idolize the minutes and hours that we devote to things. I'm so busy. I've got this dedicated to blah, blah, blah time. I don't even mm -hmm. know. Uh, you know, it, it gets to be so excessive. So, like, we're so bent on... I don't want to say maximizing time because that's not really it. It's just making sure we're utilizing all of it because it doesn't yep. necessarily mean that you're doing the right thing in that time. We just are focused on making sure we have set aside time for certain things, which isn't necessarily the right way to do it. It is in some cases, but not always. Right. So I'm kind of on the fence about what book to pick next, but I will say that there is a complimentary book that I've been reading called Some Days Today by Matthew Dix who primarily writes fiction, but has written this book and then story worthy as nonfiction books. And this one is really good. It's very complimentary to this. Um, and as I've been reading and thinking about both of these, they are kind of transforming the way that I go about my work day. So typical work day, eight hours, and I track my time. So I know how much time I spend on things. Um, and <laughs> Parkinson's law work expands to fill the time that you give it. Right. So, I have sort of been experimenting with this. We've been doing some stuff with the leadership team at the day job. And so I've had to like compartmentalize things and there's no way I'm getting all of the 
the normal stuff done because we've been in all day meetings for some of these things. So I'm trying to 80, 20 stuff and trying to just get things done. And, and, and some days today, it basically talks about how it doesn't have to be like two hours of under uninterrupted time where you are doing these things, which is the traditional time blocking approach. He shares a story about how he meets with somebody at a McDonald's who wants to pick his brain about writing. And she's uh, got all these excuses about why she hasn't written her book yet. And he's he, to make his point, he's got his laptop open at a McDonald's. He's like, you were seven minutes late today. She's like, oh, I know. I'm, I'm really sorry. And he's like, no, in those seven minutes that I was waiting for you, I wrote three great paragraphs and I revised this one. And <laughs> his, his whole point is like, there's these little pockets of times where you can actually move the needle on the things that you really want to do, especially as it pertains to, to creative or knowledge work. And so, I don't know, all this stuff is kind of bouncing around in my brain, but uh, I, I feel like uh, when it comes to my, my that's mind management not time management in a nutshell. It's like those seven minutes, what are you going to do with those? Most of us would just go surf social media, check email, whatever, kill the time, right? Instead of he's capitalizing on it and actually doing some some writing. Um, and that makes me a little bit uncomfortable because I prefer to have my day structured and time blocked, right? But page 34 in this chapter, he talks about how to get into the flow. You need to, to go with the flow. So just being ready for whatever the world is going to, to throw at you. There's the whole idea of uh, fragility and rigidity a little bit later. But uh, one other thing I did want to ask you about in this first chapter is Kaifu Lee, who is the AI expert, and uh, makes the point of saying that Kaifu Lee says that the jobs that will require creativity are safe from uh, the AI invasion. However, in recent history, there's been some uh, AI writing tools that have been making the rounds and uh, people like Nat Ellison, I saw tweet about, oh, like, there goes my job, right, as a creator, because this thing is so good at <laughs> just pulling stuff out of the air. Uh, what do you think about this? What do you think about AI writing tools like Lex.Page is the one that I'm familiar with, but I know that there's like open.ai and other, other things. Um, do you think that this statement by this AI expert who says that creative jobs are safe, do you think that's that's true in our current uh, culture. I do, because my because so there's also Jasper AI, which does some writing yep. for you. I saw beta is Notion putting something like this. I saw a thing about Notion AI where it yeah. could potentially do Crap some writing for you. Too. And the thing that the thing that they're not accounting for is the quality of writer involved. The, the chances of one of these AIs being able to write, like, say, Ryan Holiday or uh, who was a Nicholas Talib, like, being able to write at that level with the research and stuff behind it, it it's really, I don't, I don't see it as ever being possible because it has to make connections that aren't necessarily obvious. And computers would either have to randomly connect things, which then would make you question that writer quote unquote writer, or you have to have, well, I, I guess this is what I'm saying. People who write kind of like how to documents, like the stuff that I write, you could probably get rid of the voicing behind it, but you could probably get an AI to do some of the writing about the stuff that I'm doing uh, that I write about or previously have written about. Uh, so you could probably do that, but getting it to voice consistently for a specific scenario, you could again get there, but these things are in mass. They're not necessarily yeah. going to be uh, specific to a person. Now, I think you could probably get it to be specific to a person at some point, but if it gets to where these things are generating a lot of content, really what happens is they end up working themselves into a spot where they're learning from each other which opens the door to better writers having an edge because then all the stuff gets normalized to this average level and then the really good writers shine even brighter. So if you're a good writer, I think that these writing AIs are actually in your favor because it's going to bring all of the people who don't want to do the writing, they just want content to post. Like it's going to normalize all of that to a rough writing level, which is not what you want overall. So I don't really foresee these things overtaking 
I think that he's still accurate in saying that the AIs aren't going to be able to truly do that. I think they can simulate it and make it look like they're truly creative and coming up with cool connections and, and writing well, but I suspect that no matter how long they work at this, you're probably always going to be able to pick out which ones were AI written and which ones were human written. <laughs> That's my suspicion. Well, Therein lies the rub. Like, uh, I, I'd like to think you are correct. Um, I don't know, though. <laughs> I saw Ali Abdal. He was one of the early adopters of the Lex.page one. And he put together a Twitter thread, which was completely generated by the AI, sort of as a haha gotcha. You know, the last tweet in the thread was, by the way, this was all generated by AI. I didn't write any of this to see how many people could tell. Yep. <laughs> and I follow Ali Abdel pretty closely. I've been through part-time YouTuber Academy. So like I've seen him directly communicate. Fooled me. Tiago Forte did something similar. I don't know. It's, it's pretty good. <laughs> All right. You go for <laughs> it. I don't want to do it. I, I don't want to do it either, but I think it's, it's kind of interesting. Like what is the marketplace look like for, Yep. creators in the future i think there will always be distinctions uh the ways that that creators can stand out but i don't think you can just rely on the the ones that we've we've used previously i don't know like the more the more uh data you feed into the models the more accurately they can produce that stuff so you got to find new stuff yeah here's here's the other side of the coin and, and maybe you're right and maybe i'm wrong that this is, let's say that they get so good you can't tell the difference. Let's, let's just make that assumption. Uh, if you found out that Tiago Forte used an AI to write his next book, would you want to read it? No, I would not. That's the point, right? So if you know that somebody is using a computer to do all of their writing and all of their content generation, typically people back off from them. Like if they're using yep. even, even uh, ghost writers... I, I've seen where people have used ghost writers and put their name on it. People stop following them once they find out. So even if yep. these things take off, you better make sure you've got it kept as a pretty big secret that you're using that because the moment <laughs> it goes public, people drop off in droves. So I don't foresee that being a positive thing just from a moral stance, which you know, from a business stance, like you really don't want that to happen at all so a lot of these big time writers yeah they're just they're playing with it but i don't foresee that being something that's going to take that particular place by storm which means it's your low-end people trying to just generate content to get ads to get affiliate links and that sort of thing that just want the dollars off of it they're not trying to you know build or follow a mission behind it so i can see that but don't let people find out about it <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's that's a perfect place to to jump off there because uh, I mentioned Tiago Forte did a similar similar experiment with this, and uh, in his book Building a Second Brain, he talked about this idea of divergent versus convergent thinking. And uh, let's go into chapter two and and pick up that conversation there. Uh, chapter two is the creative sweet spot. And uh, this starts with a conversation about divergent and convergent thinking. I, I didn't jot a whole lot down about this because we had read about it in building a, a second brain. Um, I didn't feel there was a whole lot that was revolutionary here. But if you've not, if you're not familiar with this concept, then this is uh, worth worth uh, expanding. So divergent thinking is the uh, brainstorming and letting your brain make the connections if you were to to graphically visualize this you've got a point on the, the left side of the timeline and this is where the rays expand as you just consider all the possibilities and then when you are going to create something that's basically the point where you say okay that's enough information now you switch over into convergent thinking and the points come back together and uh, this is essentially how creators create in a nutshell, no matter what medium that they, they use. They have their antenna up, you know, they're collecting a whole bunch of dots. And then at some point they say, okay, I've got enough. Now I'm going to synthesize this down and I'm going to make something as the, the output of all of this divergent and convergent 
thinking and the, the challenge with writing David Cadavy talks about, but I, as I said, I think this is true of any creative, uh, creative endeavor is balancing this divergent and convergent thinking. How do you do this? How do I do it? Um, do, you, do you have any sort of, <laughs> sort of a framework for, yeah, this is how the process works or do you just do this without even really thinking about it? And then you know, here's the stuff at the end, which I think is probably um, a lot of people. Better. Yeah. I, it's, I don't necessarily think of it as divergent and convergent, which side note, it's weird to me that both Tiago and David use the exact same terms for the exact same content. Like it, makes me wonder did they both get it from somebody else one of them get it from the other and not attribute it to them like i have all kinds of questions after that well to be fair this book existed i think it before did. building a second brain did. yep it did but so. it makes me wonder did tiago write about it on his blog a while back and then it made it into the book i don't know i have questions yeah, i want to know the source um <laughs> that said i don't necessarily think about this as divergent and convergent I think it more around collecting dots versus connecting dots. Like you and I have talked about this before and collecting dots tends to be more around the content consumption piece. So when I'm listening to podcasts, when I'm reading books, when I'm running through certain newsletters in the morning or reading blog posts, when I'm doing those things, that's the divergent piece. Like that's where I'm expanding and collecting a whole bunch of those dots and, and gathering them in places. And then the convergent piece is when I'm like, connecting those pieces together not necessarily explicitly but just mentally in a lot of cases uh, a lot of times it ends up in uh, a note system or sometimes it's on a notepad somewhere like it it's dependent but uh, there's not really a set time or place for that convergent piece to happen at least for me the divergent piece like the the collection of the dots every morning and every night is usually the time frames where that happens for me though that's kind of changing here recently but again the convergent piece the connecting of the dots doesn't necessarily have a set place but that's how i think about it is the dot piece versus these two terms that's fair and i i like that better actually um i, I really the whole point of that discussion at the beginning of this chapter is sort of to set the stage for the creative framework that he expounds in the next chapter but before we get there the title of this chapter is the creative sweet spot so he's trying to get you to understand how the process works so you can identify your own creative sweet spot which is the time when you do your best creative work and then the argument is that you should build your schedule around this i like this idea a lot i've also heard this called a your uh, biological prime time i think that was Chris Bailey, who first uh, introduced me to that idea in the Productivity Project. Um, but the the idea is, you know, and I actually built this into my, my daily plan for a while. I had 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. highlighted because that is the, the point in the day when I'm most focused. And if I'm going to try to create something, that's like the best time to, to do that. But uh, I don't know that... The divergent versus convergent, I, I, I kind of feel that's unnecessary information. It's sort of like how the sausage is made. <laughs> and it's, I don't know, it's interesting information. I guess you could get inspired by that if you've never heard that before. But I also don't think it really matters. Uh, you, you're not actively switching. Maybe this is spoiler alert as we get into some of the other stuff. Because he's got some different ideas on how to manage your your time and, and go in and out of the different modes. Um, but I, my brain, I, I can't just say, okay, I'm going to switch now from divergent to convergent. It, it doesn't work that way. Like, yes, I could say I'm switching from this task to that task, but a lot of this is just the inspiration. Like you have to be inspired. I feel to get the insights, which he describes as a sudden realization, change of perspective or novel idea. Creative ideas are both novel and useful. So insights are just novel. You have, but you have to have a whole bunch of those insights before you can really get the creative idea that's worth developing. So he's trying to lay the, the groundwork here for identifying your creative sweet spot. 
and then talks about the two different cultural approaches to time, which I kind of teased you about at the beginning, the clock time versus the event time, right? So clock time is probably how a lot of us Americans specifically, but Westerners approach how we go about our day at two o'clock. I'm going to do this thing, but there are, uh, there are other cultures that <laughs> operate on event time. Uh, when I went down to uh, Costa Rica for a missions trip, that was uh, a, a lot of that country uh, is by event time. You know, this thing is going to happen about this time. And if people are going to show up half hour early, half hour late, whatever, eventually everyone will be here and we'll do the thing. And then when it's over, who knows when that's going to be, we'll go on to the next thing. Yep. Yep. <laughs> right. Which actually there's a lot I appreciate about that approach. Uh, and David talks about how he's even like gone to different countries that operate that way so that he can sort of facilitate that into his, uh, his creative rhythms. So there, there's a lot to be, be said for that. However, I don't think, um, I, I don't know. I have a really hard time thinking about how I could actually apply that to, uh, to my own life. There's too many people in the, in the day job and even like the extracurricular responsibilities that I have that rely on, the, the clock time for me to really just live in that event time. Yeah. I, I don't think I could live in the event time at all. There, like most of my day job is built on schedules. So, right. And, and they're not my schedules. It's not like I can control when a certain group is going to come use our sanctuary. Like I have no control over that. Uh, I just simply have to react to that. So I, I don't see that as something that I'm going to do day job wise. However, like I was saying in the middle of follow-up, like in the morning, like I have an event-based procedure that I'm going through. Again, historically, I would have said, you know, I'm going to give myself five minutes to get myself ready for the day, and then I'm going to spend 25 minutes in a workout, and then I'm going to give myself 10 minutes to get a shower and get dressed. And, like, you know what I mean? Like I would normally have kind of given it that amount of detail just because it kind of helps me think about it. But at the same time working through it from an event stance is cleaner. Uh, it's like, okay, this, and then this, and then this, and then this, what the timing is, doesn't really matter. Like I, I'm going to do th some things a little bit quicker, some things a little slower, and depending on the day, it might flux and that's okay. I, I'm totally fine with that, but I can do some of that in the afternoons as well. But again, everything is so time-based in our culture that it's kind of hard to completely break from that unless you completely break from pretty much any <laughs> social activities whatsoever. <laughs> like you're, you're going to have to go yeah. be a hermit somewhere uh, or join a culture that's adopted that or a subculture that's adopted that. But generally speaking, like I don't have that ability at all. I don't either. I like the idea. Uh, one of the distinctions he talks about is that an event time one week from today is actually eight days ahead because today is an event that is not done yet. So that's an interesting way to, to define that and that event time people are better able to savor their positive emotions, which I really like that. And again, comes that word savor. Uh, I remember talking to Chris Bailey about that, savoring the, the moment. I really like that, that, that term, that idea. The big takeaway is that we don't want to race against time. We want to walk alongside it. He puts it on page 78. He says, the point of time is not to fill as much life into a given unit of time. The point of time is to use time as a guide to live a fulfilling life. And I agree with that as well. Uh, I'm not moving to a different country like, like he did in order to accomplish that goal, but <laughs> seems a bit excessive, cool but thought. Hey, go for cool. it. <laughs> yeah. Cool thought experiment. Um, let's go into the, the next chapter here, which is, the four stages of creativity. Um, and I, I'll just ask you, what did you think about these four stages? Uh, so the four stages, to me, this made more sense than like the divergent versus convergent piece. Because like the divergent versus convergent, like I kind of get it, but like we were talking about the dots thing makes more sense to me. Uh, the four stages here, the preparation, incubation, incubation. I have a problem. My kids have been making fun of, me, fun of me for this. I have a hard time saying incubation. It comes out incubation. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. Anyway, preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. Like Those are the four stages of creativity. And I don't think these are necessarily wrong. 
I, I don't know that I have enough info on it to say that they're completely correct either, because at the same time he says these are the four stages. Later on, he'll talk about how you can jump from one to the other and it's not clean lines from one to the other. Whereas the term stages to me is like zero, one, two, three. It's in a line, just like the stages, yeah. like you start at one and then you go to the next stage, then you go to the next stage, then you go to the next stage. But when you can move around on all of them, like it's basically having lines that connect all of them to each other, which means it's not really stages. So then is it really four different elements of creativity? I mean, it's similar to like the laws of creativity, I guess, but I, I don't know. I'm still kind of up in the air on this one and kind of looking at it side-eyed. Well... This is not original to David Kadavi. Uh, this is actually the four stages of control identified by a psychologist whose name is Graham Wallace. However, I think these are garbage. <laughs> okay. Thank you for saying that because I haven't been able to completely nail down like my thoughts on this. So tell me why you think they're garbage. Okay. So when I hear these four stages, I think of a linear progression. Right. Yep. And you can see retroactively how something would move once it's over through these four different stages. However, you tell me the point where you can control moving from incubation to illumination. How does that work? You can't. No. You don't just no. push a button and get the insight or the aha moment, which is the definition of illumination. So at that point, well, this is nice information, but how am I going to apply this? And I'm biased here already because I have my own version of this. <laughs> Maybe that's why you I'm don't like sure. it. <laughs> well, I, I honestly think mine's better. Uh, so as I was, as I, I I've, I've been going through a, uh, I've been doing a lot of thinking about my creative work and I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm still kind of thinking through like what exactly this, this looks like, but there is a, there is this, there's two different approaches, I guess, for like a writer. Like you could try to be a New York times bestselling author, sign a book deal. That's kind of the thing that everybody wants to do. Right. But the more I read books like this by David Kadavi, I, I realize like he's self-publishing this. I could totally do this. And honestly, this is becoming more and more attractive to me, this like self-publishing route, because I have a whole bunch of these models that could be books. And so I've got this, these five C's of creativity, I call them, which I think could be the basis for a book just like this one that David Kadavi wrote. And it was at this point when I read these four stages, cause he's kind of laying this as like, well, this is how this all works. Right. And I'm like, no, I have a better one. <laughs> I need to get this into the hands of people. Like he's writing for the same people that I would be creating for. And I'll just share my five C's, I guess. And we can go from there. And I've, I've done like whole workshops on these. So I'm going to try to condense this down into like two minutes, but my five C's are capture, curate, cultivate, connect and create. So capture that this is divergent thinking, right? You're just grabbing all the dots you can and then curate. Once you have all these dots, then you're picking the ones that are valuable. And those are the ones that ultimately end up in obsidian for me. You're not dumping everything in there. You're curating the museum of your mind, right? So you're trying to pick the highest quality stuff and you're cutting a whole bunch of things because you're trusting that the really good ones are going to come back to you later. And this is why I agree with you that AI isn't going to completely replace people who do this the right way, but you may have to change how you do it. All right. So then you've curated these things and then you, you cultivate them, right? This is where you bounce them around and you don't really know what seeds you planted in the greenhouse of your mind, but you're going to water them. You're going to give them the right conditions. You're going to ask some questions about them and see what they turn into. You're not going to put any pressure on this one has to be the thing, but you're just going to kind of see what develops. And then once these things start to start to grow, 
they poke up through the ground. You start to see what these things are. Then you connect them to other other ideas. And this is where like the whole bi-directional linking thing to me is is fascinating because it gives you a visual representation of the type of stuff that your brain would be doing anyways. And so this is really cool. I like this. And then finally, after you do all that, then convergent, you decide I'm going to create something. And this whole process, if you follow it before you actually sit down to write for someone who has for the last several years had to create on a deadline. Like if you just sit down like, okay, I got to write something. What am I going to write about that? That's scary. You I, I've had to develop this process and bookworm is a big part of this. Honestly, this is the first four steps in a nutshell done every couple of weeks. And by doing that and collecting all these ideas, you know, I never run out of, of stuff to, to write about or create about, talk about. Um, that's, you know, that was happening long before I had connected note taking tools. But by the time I was able to see the connected note taking tools, I'm like, okay, this, this fits in with this, this model that I've been practicing for, for a while now. I don't know, but I feel like there are very clear distinctions with those five C's of like, now I can go on to the next stage and you can define for yourself, this one's done now. I'm going to go do the next thing as opposed to just, when's that illumination going to come? <laughs> yeah. I think there's, there's a, a potential that you, you're trying to develop an idea and you're looking for that aha moment and it could never come. Uh, and you got to be willing to go try something else after a while. Yeah, just to put some more meat on his four stages of creativity, just so people can compare that to your five C's of creativity here. Uh, there's the four, which are the preparation, incubation, uh, illumination, and verification. So preparation is basically, uh, to kind of correlate, it's kind of like collect and curate, not necessarily curate, but more collect. Like you're, you're just kind of doing the research part of it, collecting a whole bunch of ideas around an idea. The incubation part uh is is really just taking time away from it it is kind of his uh, and I, i'm saying this knowing what the rest of the book holds uh from right. this point on like it's really just step away from it and then once you've done your research and you've stepped away from it you're kind of just waiting for something to hit you which i don't necessarily like because it doesn't necessarily give you the freedom to say, I'm going to keep cranking on this every day. I don't remember which author it was that said that they only write when inspiration strikes. Thankfully, it strikes at eight o'clock every morning. Like, I don't know yeah. who that was or what that, where it comes from at this point. But that idea is like, put in the work. Like, you're not sitting back waiting. You're just going to get to work. Uh, the verification piece you don't really have here, uh, but it's, it's where you're testing yeah. the idea to see if it's valid with other people. Um, I, I would say that it's possible in your framework that that fits inside that convergent piece because you might be testing that just through like short form content or from talking to other people. Like that's maybe part of your process of the converging down to the idea. But in his particular yeah. case, what he's referring to is you've had your illuminated idea and then you're basically trying to figure out number one, is it unique? And number two, do other people like it or not? Like that's, that's really what he's getting at with those particular pieces. Yeah. I think you could probably add, uh, I don't have additional C's for this, but after create for me, yeah, <laughs> right. I typically create publish you could, and, and the type of stuff that I do, I feel like that is the right approach. But if you're writing a book, for example, yeah, you want to create and then you want to share and get feedback and then you want to edit and revise and then finally publish. So create the create process that's the i think that's the part that uh maybe is a little bit different for everybody but also the the main point here is that there are steps before that which make the create part possible and i do not like the fact that you are completely dependent on some inspiration which <laughs> may or may not come right yeah and, and maybe that's why i was a little bit thrown off on this because he, again he's got the stages right and he even called out that sometimes you can be in the middle of preparation and the illumination happens immediately. But then he gave examples. I didn't write them down. I wish I had. He gave examples of a few people who did this 
And the examples all bypassed the verification phase entirely and went straight to publish, which isn't even <laughs> a stage here. So yeah. even that was a little, little bit like, huh, interesting. So they skipped incubation and they went right to illumination, bypassed verification and went to like the fifth step that he doesn't talk about, which is releasing something. So yeah. yes. Okay. Thanks for helping me feel better about that. Cause I just could not get my fingers around why I didn't like this. <laughs> no problem. Leave it to me to, to pick on somebody else's idea. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Mike. All right. Let's go on to the next section, which I don't think we're going to spend a whole lot of time here because I don't really like this one. Uh, chapter four is the seven mental states of creative work. And I'll just run through these. They are prioritize, explore, research, generate, polish, administrate, and recharge. I, I guess, you know, I, I understand these, but I don't know. The way he describes these... I was left thinking like, I do not want to manage my creative process this way. He's even got like different places that he goes throughout his day. He kind of bounces around between different locations for these different modes. And, and I've, I've understand that. Like I used to go from coffee shop to library to co-working space and I would use, like I'd go there and I'd write for an hour and a half and then I'd like hit a block and then I would just change location and then that travel time, that was enough to, by the time I got to the new place, get the creative juices working again. But I I don't want to try to define those things. Uh, I think this is, this is too much, too much detail, uh, and it's unnecessary. Uh, there are three questions in this section, which I like, though, which I think these are valuable, not in terms of trying to figure out which of the seven mental states am I going to function in, <laughs> But what work do I need to do right now? What mood do I need to be in to do that work? And when was the last time I felt that way? I feel like if you just asked those three questions and discarded the seven mental states, you could make a lot of hay with this. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I, I, number one, he does have an acronym for this. Do you remember what it was? It's, it's, yeah, the, it was something golf related. Yeah, per golf par. Yeah, yeah, right. I was so, looking at it. I knew par was the last part. Yeah, yeah so prioritize, explore, research, per. Generate is golf. And then polish, administrate, recharge is par. So per golf, par. I don't like that. Somebody was stretching <laughs> to get an acronym working here. Um, we that, don't need more acronyms. <laughs> I know, and but what I, what I struggle with on this is seven mental states of creative work. And as I'm looking at these, you know, one of the things he talks about is, you know, setting aside time in your week. He gets into like the cycles in the next year. So I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but you know, he, he talks about having specific points in your day and week when you do these different types of like put yourself in these different states just because of energy levels and how they wane throughout the day and throughout the week. And he, intentionally puts all of his administration stuff on Friday afternoons because it's like the low energy doesn't take much to get it done sort of thing. Uh, and then he uses Monday mornings and every morning for the generate, like doing the harder, you know, creative generative work. And in my mind, I'm thinking that, you know, the administrative stuff is stuff I absolutely despise doing. So I have to do that Monday morning when I've got the most energy Otherwise, it won't happen at all because I'll get to Friday afternoon and be like, screw it. I'm not doing that. Like, <laughs> that's not sure. happening. So it's completely backwards. But that also means that the administration piece, the mental state of administrate that he has, uh, from an energy stance, to me, is identical to generate. So I might be in a slightly different mind frame on that. But as far as energy and, like, state of being, like, that's kind of the same. Uh and I get why he's got it that way, like why he's got him broken out. But that I struggle with. Things like, uh, which ones were they? The polish piece and the research piece and the explore piece. Like we're, we're starting to get into a realm where I feel like these can all start to overlap, like from a mental yeah. state stance. The, the only exactly. difference is what you're choosing to do. So I yep. feel like there's really only maybe three here. Like you, you, you've got like the hard work 
Like it's like low, medium, high is really what we're talking about. So like the low energy stuff puts you in recharge state, like and recharge and explore. Like that's low energy. You can do that no matter when you want. Uh, the medium stuff is when you're doing the specific researching and you're doing the, you know, the polish editing work. And then the high energy stuff is when you're actually doing the original writing and you're doing the administration piece. Like that, it's low, medium, high. So welcome to Stephen Covey land. You know, we're, <laughs> we're into you know, a three state model instead of a seven, which I feel like is a lot easier to get your head around than it is to get around seven. As I was going, I was like, I feel like this takes a lot of management, which you can see when you start to look at his overall system. Like exactly. it's an entirely too complicated structure, which again, we'll get into this on the next one, but I, I cool concept. I, I, I like that he's at least attempting to identify this, but I can't, get on board with this whole seven state thing i i the seven mental states doesn't make any sense he should remove this section rename the chapter and just talk about how the environment affects your your state because he talks about this construal level theory where we tend to think big picture when things are far away and small picture when we're in a small space that makes a ton of sense there's all that, that was an aha moment for me you can change your mental state by changing your environment. He talks about the slippy and grippy tools that are allow us to easily get on or off of tasks and talks about his alpha smart Neo that he uses to write as an example. This is great. Like th th I have no interest in this. Thing. I have zero interest in that, but I thought it was hilarious that he uses it. <laughs> yeah. So I saw a related to this. Um, Mike Vardy showed me one time there's a, it's the same sort of thing, uh, Heming Wright or something like that. Uh, I don't know. It's a, it's this little keyboard sort of a thing where all you can do is write on it, and it it's cool. I'm not going to buy one, but then I also have a Remarkable, <laughs> so right. it's the same sort of thing for note taking as opposed to to writing. I think this is. I, I don't know. I think there's a lot to be said about the the constraints of the the tools that you use, but. I don't know. Just talk about that. Don't talk about the the seven mental states. Um, I, I don't have anything else to say about this this chapter. You want to go into the the next one? No, not yet. So there's there's okay. one point in this. So I didn't like the seven states. I didn't really like his alpha smart because I'm not doing that. But the the one thing in this whole section uh, that really struck me as like that that's a really good way to explain this was the slippy and grippy thing that you kind of mentioned in passing there. Uh, mm -hmm. it, really, what he means there is if you have a tool. Think of your tools as either slippery or grippy. Uh, a computer, like your laptop, would be a very slippery tool because it's very easy to move from one thing to another that then leads to distraction, right? Whereas a grippy tool would be like pen and paper. You really can't get lost on social media on pen and paper. Like it just doesn't happen unless you switch tools, in which case you're now on a slippery tool. So like that concept of choosing which tool and which type for the different type of uh, work that you're doing, I think is important. Um, at the same time, he made the point that the grippier a tool, the less easy it is to move the data from one place to another. Yeah, right. So if you're using pen and paper, that's great. It's a very grippy tool. But when it comes to editing, that's a very difficult task to accomplish. Whereas yep. a very slippery tool makes that process very easy because it can move things from thing to thing very easily. So anyway, I don't really have anything specific that that leads me to wanting to do. I just thought that that concept was very helpful just to think about it that way. Exactly. And it has nothing to do with the name of the chapter. The Absolutely none. Stuff. None. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unnecessary. All right. Let's go to chapter five, which is the creative cycles. And this is kind of talking about the, the rhythms around you. Um, I have a a uh, action item associated with this one to document my weekly cycles or or rhythms. I mean, that's the chapter in a nutshell. <laughs> is that there are rhythms to everything, especially rhythms to your creative work, and it's worth paying attention to how those rhythms operate. You want to be able to get into the the flow, basically, and. Um, and, and go with that when the opportunity is there, uh, not squander your your rhythms on 
things that you sh you should be doing other other places and they're different for every person like you mentioned the admin stuff that you absolutely hate you got to do that on mondays right so that's the kind of thing i want to do is figure out like what are mondays what are tuesdays what are wednesdays etc uh, and i've done this before i've not done it recently with the day job however i think i can which is why i want to spend some time thinking about this yeah, so there's, I actually have three action items from this section, and I didn't really like it. Nice. <laughs> so this, this is the weird thing about this book. It's like, I don't agree with this, but it spurred me to have a different thing altogether. So uh, one of these is exactly what you're talking about, mapping the week according to like mental states, uh, knowing that what I'm going, like the mental states that I'm going to map are going to be different than what he has here. So like like what you were just saying, like the administrative thing Monday morning, like that, I, I've kind of done that for a while and it does seem to, to work well. Um, so anyway, I, I want to work through that. Uh, he does talk about, he's a big GTD David, a David Allen fan, which is interesting how that kind of comes out. Uh, but mm -hmm. he talks about doing a weekly review and like this is his gold time right where he sets up the entire week um i don't know that i want to do this but i, I want to try it once just to see what it does from a mind state mental state uh, but he does this planning session on mondays or on sundays excuse me uh, where he schedules the tasks for the day and time of the week when he's going to do them and i've kind of been doing this on a day-to-day -day level but he made the point that if you do it on a weekly level you really have a hard time pushing something off till tomorrow because you've already got tomorrow set up, which means that if you don't do it today, you've got to do a lot of extra work in order to accommodate that change. And that's the type of thing that works really well for me is when I put myself up against a deadline or a wall that I can't move. That works really well for Joe. So I, again, I don't know that this is going to work because I don't even know that I know enough of the tasks that I need to do in a week, generally speaking, to be able to do this. Uh, but I at least want to make an attempt just to see what it does from a mind frame state. Mind state? Frame? Mental state. I keep using weird terms on that. So <laughs> there's those two. And then the last one here, uh, it's in the section referring to cycles in cultural, uh, in cultural cues. So... He mentions base camp, and we've talked about base camp before in like eight week cycles and such. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Did you get excited about this part? I did. And this is one of my uh, my talking points I wanted to to talk about is the this week of want, uh, which is what I have defined as a sabbatical. And every time I bring this up on Focused, all the cranky people in the Mac Power Users Forum say that's not a sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> And you're technically right, but you're missing the point. And I didn't have another term for it. Yeah. Basically what it is, is a, a regular cadence where you take a week off and you can do whatever you want. That is exactly how Sean McCabe has defined this seventh week sabbatical. Yep. And it is amazing and everybody should do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't really have the ability to take an entire week off to do whatever I want. Like, I, you know, day job stuff. So I don't really have that ability. But what I do have the ability to do is operate on eight week cycles uh, namely six weeks and then a couple weeks of cleanup around those and, and tie off and stuff. Uh, I actually had a conversation about this with um, my IT assistant and he's on board to try it kind of as a department knowing it's just the two of us, it makes it fairly easy. Uh, but we also have other volunteer teams involved. So yes, it's just the two of us in a department, but there's maybe 25 people involved that I'm gonna be trying to get on board with this concept. Uh, so I, I want to work on that. I think what I'm going to end up doing is we're going to operate internally and me personally on an eight-week cycle first, and then we'll start incorporating the broader teams into that. Uh, just because the cyclical nature of that, I feel like, works really well. I've been slowly realizing that I work on enough cycles that this could be very helpful, and implementing these on a larger scale would be very helpful. So this is kind of a first step towards doing that on a broader scale. Love it. All right. Uh, anything else before we go into the next chapter? I don't think so. Other than like, this is the whole section where he has all of these ridiculous 
I do this on this day and I do this on that day and this happens here and I do this after this and it's like I I am lost on what your schedule looks like. I for somebody who's not into time management, I feel like you'd have to do a lot to do what you do. This is somebody who obviously does not have kids. <laughs> very true, very true. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the next chapter, chapter six, which is creative systems. Oh, good. It's a systems book. It's your favorite. Not really. Not really. But uh, this is interesting because I, I do think that when it comes to creativity, it's worth considering systems because most people view creativity as a flash of inspiration. That's how I used to view it. And that meant that for a long time, I did not think I was creative because I didn't get those flashes of inspiration very often. Uh, I realized after a while that creativity is more of a formula. And that is basically what he's talking about uh, in this, this chapter. Uh, creative systems are repeatable processes that help you bring creative works from idea through execution. However, there is a term in here which I like the minimum creative dose. And this is the thing I was talking about with uh, Some Days Today by Matthew Dix. Um, and just he writes whenever he's got a, a couple of minutes with nothing to do. And I really like that that idea. What is the minimum amount of time or whatever you, that, you, that you would need in order to actually make something? I guess time is the, the easy one, but we're talking about my management here, not time management. So like what is the mental state that you have to be in going back to those three questions. And then how do you put yourself in that mental state and reduce as much friction as you can? That's the whole idea of the systems so that when you get inspired, you can capture something knowing that it, even if it's just a paragraph or two, eventually that's going to add up and produce the 60,000 words that you need to make your average book or whatever. Um, once you get the systems in place, he says that you can move creative projects forward on the back burner. So you define front burner where you need full attention. Back burner is it simmering in the background. And this is where I felt vindicated. If you remember back in episode, I'm going to guess 60 something, we did uh, Work Clean by Dan Charnas. Yep. And I talked about how I was going to create a back burner perspective and OmniFocus. Yep. And you rightfully pushed me on this and like, so what does this actually do? Yep. This is what it does. <laughs> <laughs> All these years but later. But it I did fail, if I recall it. correctly. <laughs> it did. It did. But this was the idea that I had in the back of my mind that I could not articulate. Uh, where you have something and it's just, you're going to let it simmer. And a lot of the, the stuff that happens in the seven mental states and the four stages and nine whatever is you know <laughs> all these lists uh that can happen but you're not actively paying attention to it i think this is a really cool idea i i i jest when i say i feel vindicated but this, know, this, that, that, that is what it reminded me of and that i think this is a really cool idea because i think a lot of people view it as like it's on or it's off there's no i'm just going to set this to the side and my brain is subconsciously going to continue to work on this but that's ultimately what's happening and that's what david cadavi is talking about and the section i think maybe a, maybe a good example of front burner versus back burner uh would be you know when we started bookworm it was very much front burner like what does recording look like what's our normal cadence of the show and what are the elements of the show that we're going to cover how do we pick books at the very beginning we kind of collaborated like we kind of worked together to figure out what books came next and then we fell into the cadence of every other uh, I don't think we ever actually explicitly said that that's what we were going to do, but it just kind of happened. Uh, so it was very much front burner. We had to think through all the details. And then over time, those details kind of take care of themselves, and you just kind of know what's happening. Whereas like right now, at least in my world, I'm going to project this onto you, Mike. Bookworm is more of a back burner project that we do because it's the same process every two weeks, we generally know who's in charge of doing the notes set up for that week based on who picked the book. We know who's picking the book next. We know like Joe's going to set up the live stream. Mike's going to take care of the editing pieces. Like we know all those things are going to happen. We don't have to think about them. They just kind of happen because we know 
all this stuff, which means to produce a bookworm episode now is significantly less work than it was way back at the beginning. Just because you have all that exactly. stuff, quote unquote, back burner, it doesn't mean it's a stopped project. It just means you don't have to have the mental wherewithal to have it on, you know, full focus the whole time in order to have it completed. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Um, a couple other ideas that kind of, uh, from this chapter that kind of tie into this, um, when it comes to productivity, open loops are the enemy, but with creativity, open loops are a gift. Uh, I like that idea. So when I don't really know exactly what something is, that's the time when I don't try to push it forward anymore. I put it on the back burner. Um, I guess that's more, more personally as it pertains to, to bookworm. I think you're right though, that, uh, by doing a whole bunch of these episodes, we just kind of fall into the, the rhythm and the conversation that happens every other Friday as a, per the release schedule, that's almost a byproduct at this point. Like we just trust the process. We read the books, we show yep. up, we talk about them, right? There is no, what is the end result going to look like? All that stress is, is gone. And, and I feel like anyone who creates regularly on whatever medium, whether that's blogging or YouTube, whatever, they achieve that same thing. Uh, and the systems are the thing that allow you to get there. However, you don't have to have it all figured out at the beginning. He talks about standard operating procedures. Uh, he, actually, he called them something different. Sloppy. Then he, well, he changed it eventually to sloppy. But yeah, so it's sloppy operating procedures, he says, are, are living documents. And that's what standard operating procedures are supposed to be. <laughs> They're supposed to be malleable. But anyway, so I didn't like that part. Uh, specifically I thought it was just stretching. He, I like, you're just trying to make was, a point here. It was. I know what he's going for. A lot of times we, we document something there. This is the process. It must be followed. But no, you should be asking yourself how it can be improved. But what that does, once you have those things, and those things are, are discoverable just by doing it a bunch, it's like, oh, this is, how this, this is how this happens. And then once you put together, <laughs> I mean, a lot of times you don't even really need the, the specifics of those things. You just need like the, the checklist, the, the basics in order to, to follow through with it. Once we get done recording, I give the files to Toby, he edits them, then I get the final file, I create the WordPress post, I put in the, the, uh, all the links, I schedule it, I mark that book as complete, I create the new one. Like These are all things I don't even need to go back and reference anymore. <laughs> I've done it enough times. Yep. So yeah, it, it's the, the rhythm and the, the systems create the rhythms. However, sometimes those rhythms get disrupted. That is the point of the next chapter, uh, creating in chaos. And the, the big idea here is essentially things aren't going to go as planned. <laughs> uh, it, it mentions that rigidity creates fragility. And I think we probably both experienced this. You can get so attached to your plan on this is how things should go that when that gets disrupted it makes you for me anyways it would like make me upset and uh i'd be frustrated that my plan has been messed up and at that point like it's not helping you to be upset about it yeah maybe you had planned on doing focus work for the next couple of hours and you got distracted but what are you going to do with that distraction could you do anything about it was it controllable well if not and there's absolutely nothing <laughs> that you can do about it. Uh, if it is something that you could control or could be prevented, like you can take a note and change a system and hopefully it doesn't happen again. But if there's nothing you could have done about it, then just roll with it. I mean, deal with the thing, then get back to work. Don't be upset that you lost whatever whatever time. And really, the the, the best creators, I feel like the argument he's making here, are the ones who are able to just roll with the punches the most. Yeah, there's people who, you mentioned the the quote, you know, I only write when inspiration strikes. Fortunately, it's 9 a.m. every morning. We read the book on the daily rituals and like a lot of people structure their environments to support this stuff. But every single person is going to have stuff that doesn't <laughs> doesn't go their way. And the better you are at just being flexible with that stuff, I feel like the the more prolific your output is going to be in the long run. Yeah, and just to put some more background to this he he tells the story of how 
granted, in the last like couple chapters, he's been telling us about his borderline insane schedule and process that he goes through in order to maintain his creative energy. And then at the beginning of this chapter, because before this chapter, I was kind of thinking like, dude, you're crazy. Like that's kind of where I was sitting with this. Like, come on, like, sure, this works for you, but this is going to work for like 0.001% of the population. There's not anyone else really that can do it like this. And then he gets to this chapter and he tells the story of how his mom had a brain hemorrhage and all rituals, all practices out the window immediately. And he goes to be by her side, changes up his routines a bit to allow him to kind of keep going. He's working on this particular book in the midst of this. Uh, he's deciding what to let go of and what to keep working on. He keeps his podcast, he keeps his newsletter, and then he, he dropped working on the book for a while and then he picks the book back up. So that's some of the story behind this. And then he kind of walks through. It's like, okay, when things break down and things fall apart, you know, you, you got to kind of roll with the punches. Now, the part, <clears throat> maybe this is towards the end of this, but he, he does talk about how he wished that he could be one of those people that just kind of goes to a coffee shop, puts out their 250 quality words, and they're done for the day. And, like, that was his original goal whenever he was writing a book but then he got into this whole creative stages and mental states thing and he developed this whole system because he couldn't just go do that and then at the end of the book he's able to do that okay so you kind of went full circle like you wanted to do this but you couldn't and then you went through this crazy stuff and now you can maybe it's just because he learned some lessons in the process which i would assume is what happened but it's like okay why didn't you just start with that thing at the very beginning and keep working at that until it stuck like you know we talk about this all the time the consistency piece is the part that matters right develop the routines develop the habits uh be okay to flex them if you need to but that's the important part which is what he ends up with at the very end uh, but he went through an awful lot to get there but again it's not necessarily bad this is part memoir in the way he has this book written but that's kind of the process he takes us through right yeah and then uh he shares a whole bunch of tactical things as a result of that, yes. which I, I think these are dumb. <laughs> I didn't write any of them down. I wrote the section headings down, but the literally the only one that I wrote uh, was the doorway effect. He's talking about task triggers and how when you walk through a doorway, you tend to forget the thing that you were doing or going for. Something about walking through a doorway resets your mind. It's like, huh. I feel like I have maybe heard of that before, but it completely left my mind. So I was like, okay, now I have a note about it. <laughs> like I'll keep track of that one later and see when it pops up again. But I thought that was interesting. Maybe that's why I forget things when I walk across <laughs> the building. Yeah, so some of the specifics here uh, mentions that when you're managing creative projects, context or mental states, remember his affinity for GTD. He talks about tags for mental states on tasks. Absolutely not. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope, nope, nope. That's way too much micromanagement. Um, he talks about cascading inboxes, which in general, I think, are a bad idea. However, when it comes to ideas, I don't think they're necessarily bad. I mentioned my five C's of creativity. That depends on me capturing things to drafts and then eventually curating those and sending them to, to uh, Obsidian. But I think uh, the way he describes them I think this is dangerous. You want less inboxes in your life, not more. Could you, real quick, could you maybe explain cascading inboxes for people? Yeah, so things go into one inbox, and then as you process that inbox, they go to another inbox, and then ideally, uh, or not ideally, but I guess if you carry out this, this, uh, this idea, uh, there's no level, there's no cap on like the number of levels down you could go. So you could have an inbox that leads to an inbox that leads to an inbox that leads to an inbox. And that's where I think like people could get in trouble with this. Uh, you want less inboxes to check. Um, if you have a bunch of inboxes, there's a higher chance that one of them is going to be neglected. I think one example of this is like Evernote. Back in the day, people used to clip everything, send it to Evernote. They'd never go in and clean up Evernote, right? So it end up with a whole bunch of junk in there. And that's the, the danger of a neglected inbox. Uh, I do think there is value in this principle when applied uh, 
strict uh, tactically, I guess uh, you got to be really, really careful. But when it comes to ideas, this is the the only one that I can think of where I would want multiple inboxes, but I would cap it at two. I want to just capture the things so I don't forget about them. And then from there, I'll, I'll pick the ones that really matter. But I'm not doing that for email. I'm not doing that for tasks. I mean, whatever other inbox in your life you can you can think of, uh, I think these cascading inboxes could could do more harm than good. And the way he defines them is just kind of like, this is a good thing. You should apply this where you can. And I'm like, no, you should apply it one specific place and then nowhere else. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not something that I want to do. I I kind of do a two level thing. I don't. I wouldn't even call it that though, because I I capture almost everything into drafts or on a notebook, uh, and from there I'll usually make like two passes on it. One is like, okay, these are the things I know I don't need at all, or these are the things that I know exactly where they go. Like it's a quote. Well, I know exactly where I'm putting all quotes that I want to hold on to. Uh, but when it gets to like, okay, this is an idea for an entire business. Okay, there's a few different ways that I would want to manage that depending on the type of arena it sits in so sometimes i'll leave it in the inbox intentionally and know that i'll get back to it in say a couple couple days when i go through that inbox again and by that time uh, I, I might know exactly where it needs to go sometimes i don't and it sits there and i've had things sit in that inbox for two weeks just trying to figure out where it needs to go knowing that i don't want to get rid of it so maybe that kind of fits into that realm but really it's all in one place so it's not like it's a different location Right, right. All right, anything else before we get into action items? No, I kind of want to be done with it. <laughs> All right, let's do it. So action items. Uh, I have a couple of them. The uh, first one comes from the chapter, actually, that uh, I did not like. <laughs> Way back in Chapter 4, uh, which talks about seven mental states of creative work. Uh, I feel those mental states did not provide me much value, but the discussion about the environments did. So I want to consider the environments in my rituals. Uh, I don't know that anything is necessarily going to change from this. I just want to think about the rituals that I have and where they take place. Basically ask those three questions. What work do I need to do? What mood do I need to be in to do that work? When is the last time I felt that way? And see if there isn't some low hanging fruit, some things that I can change in terms of my environments and where I try to do certain things. But um, I'm not requiring necessarily that I, I change something there. I just wanna spend some time thinking about it. And then the other one is to document my weekly rhythms. I think he would define them as cycles, but. I view cycles as like those eight week cycles that we were talking about with the week of want. Uh, and really, I just want to think about like, how am I theming my days and can I batch my tasks in uh, on certain days in order to free myself up and operate in different modes the other days. I don't know that I'll be able to make a whole lot of changes here because like you, day job, other responsibilities, kids, et cetera. <laughs> Uh, I don't have complete control over how I stack the the tasks that I do in, in any given day, but I'm going to see if there isn't uh, some improvement that I could make somewhere. How about you? Yeah, so I have the three that we talked about earlier. Uh, one is, I think, I think I'm just terming this differently than what you're doing. You're talking about documenting a weekly rhythm. I kind of want to map my week according to like energy levels and types of work. Like there's the administration side, there's creative side, there's like architecture and infrastructure sides. So like I know where those tend to fit best, uh, but I, I don't really have that anywhere. So I kind of need to map that out, document it, whatever you want to call that. So I'm calling it mapping it. Uh, so that's one. Two, uh, I'm going to make an attempt. I believe this has to happen on a Sunday for me. Uh, mapping, not mapping, but scheduling out the tasks for the week ahead of time. I'm gonna to commit to doing this once until we record next, just because I I don't know how that's gonna go and I don't wanna say I'm gonna do it twice because I think it's gonna potentially be bad. It's either gonna go really well or really poorly and I don't know which one it is. So <laughs> I wanna at least try it mostly from a mental state stance uh, to see how that goes. Uh, and then working on incorporating eight week cycles. Um, I, I suspect that I'm at a point in the year where I kinda of need to wait till January 1 
for that to technically take place, but I've probably got the right time frame right now to do the planning for that. And since it's the first time I'm doing that, it's probably going to take me a little longer to prep for that well. So that's what I need to to work on. So my goal is to start that on January 1, but I got to get the planning stage of that done right now. So those are the three. All right. Well, let's go into style and rating then. Uh, my book. So I will go first. And uh, I think this is a really important topic. I think this is a good book in speaking to this whole idea of mind management, not time management. Uh, yeah, it's exactly what the title says, but that's exactly what you get from this book. And uh, I feel like there's some stuff in here that is not necessary, but it doesn't feel like it's an extended book. You know, sometimes we read these these business productivity books and it's uh, 200 pages and it could have been a blog post, right? That's not what this is. There's a lot of good stuff in here. There's just also some stuff that I feel like I wouldn't have included it, like the seven mental states, for example. But I'll just chalk that up to uh, different personalities. Um, there's some stuff in here that I just absolutely think he's he's off base with. Like in the last chapter, the there's way too much management in terms of the tasks and the tags for the mental states and emotional context, yada, yada, yada. Like, you don't need all that stuff. Um, the average person, though, I think could benefit a lot from just considering your sweet spot, your rhythms, understanding how creativity works and how it's not just blocking out time on your calendar. Very powerful idea. Just realizing that because you have time to create set aside doesn't mean when you sit down to actually create during that time that the ideas are going to flow. You have to do some additional work there. But I think the 80-20 is just recognizing that uh, you have to put yourself in a, in a position to, to do that. And if you pay attention to when you do that naturally or when it's easiest, you can move some things around and, and get some benefit from that. So I guess what I'm saying is that uh, I feel anybody can benefit from reading this book. Even you and I who are familiar with some of these ideas, the whole mind, mind management over time management, that's not something new. We were talking at the beginning, we've implemented some of this stuff already. Like, I still got a lot out of this. Uh, there's still some action items I'm gonna take, but even without that, I feel like I walk out of reading this book with a better understanding and therefore better prepared to make the most of my creative rhythms. Um, I was hoping this would just be like the book to end all other books when it comes to what is actually, what is productivity actually? <laughs> uh, I don't think that's what I got. Uh, I'm going to give it 4.0. It's a good book. It's not a great book. Uh, I think there's some great ideas in here, but it... I don't know. I was a little bit disappointed, to be honest. Uh, it started off really well. Felt like it kind of lost some steam towards the end. I think there's more to be said on this topic. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but I felt a little bit wanting at the end. Uh, the style is is good. He's a good writer. The stories that he tells are, are really powerful. Uh, the story about going to... Uh, to be with his his mom who eventually passed away and being with his dad uh, there's one specific part of that where like he's got his morning routine and he decides just to chuck it because he sees his dad sitting at the the kitchen table he's like let's just go for a walk right that's that's powerful it's emotional it's a great way to end this book um but it also i i, I don't know I, I feel like it it doesn't really get into the uh, the mechanics of it enough for me to to be like okay so how do i actually implement this going all the way back to those four stages that's great information but am i just going to sit and wait for the inspiration to come like what can i actually do about that so i don't know maybe carol's right maybe i need to write that book i don't know <laughs> <laughs> you definitely do you certainly do all right what about you yeah so there's a uh on the back of the book, there's a quote that he uh, he says, effortlessly getting more out of your mind 
referring to the content of this book. Uh, I, I wrote this down at the very beginning, but I just stated like, that's a really high claim. It's an extremely high claim to effortlessly get more out of your mind, especially when there's a, a tremendous amount of effort that he has put in in order to get more out of his mind, having read the book. So I think that's a bit of a misnomer in, in that particular piece. Uh, he does have, like, he refers to, like, all of his task management stuff that you talked about. Uh, I really wanted to know what tool he was using for that because of the different things he was talking about. Did you ever figure this out? Do you know what he uses? Mm, I don't remember. Uh, I remember being curious, but then maybe I just wrote it off as, like, oh, it's not going to be anything that I would use because he's using the way he's using tags right. and contents. Yeah, I never did figure it out. So he doesn't state it in the book. He does have a tools link that you can go to, uh, which is a sign up for his email newsletter. It's like, okay, for, for the sake of all the bookworm listeners, I'll do this. So I signed <laughs> up for his newsletter in order to get this. And then he never states what tools he uses. He has a bunch of affiliate links for mm -hmm. specific like notebooks and stuff that he likes to use, but he never states what digital tools he's using for writing, for task management, for note taking. He doesn't mention any of that, which I feel mm -hmm. like is a core component of what you would expect to find there. Maybe that's just my bias coming through. Anyway, that rubbed me the wrong way uh, for that particular piece. I, I think he needs a real editor. I can't tell if he actually did. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> uh, there was a number, I, I wish I had been keeping track of it, but he talks about like, when I was writing my first book or five months into my second book or you know something along those lines, he makes that specific worded specifically worded phrase, he uses that many, many times. And it was just like, stop, find a different way to say this. So there's there's a lot of stuff like that. I, I know that you like his storytelling. It kind of was hard for me. I think I would disagree with you on that one just because I struggled to follow sometimes. I felt like he was repeating some of his stuff and I just he just needed somebody to help him with some of that. So he's not a bad writer. I think he's a great writer. He just needed some help on this, I think. I think it just needed somebody else to give him once or twice over on it, and it could have been so much better had that been done. That particular process may have helped with this four stages and seven mental states piece. Just from a structure stance, he maybe could have gotten some help there. That said, like the the seven states, the four stages, although those aren't necessarily things that I find myself saying, yes, that's the right way to do that. At the same time, it made me stop and think through like, okay, well, what are those stages? What are those states? Like I'm taking his seven and condensing it down into three. That's forever the type of thing I do is I consolidate things all the time. So that absolutely fits my brain. So that's the type of thing I would do, but he obviously has spent maybe a little more time with that particular model. So maybe it's possible I'm just not at that stage yet. Like I don't understand it at his level. That's possible. So I, I will leave that on the table as something that's, uh, there's opportunity there. Right now, I think he's completely bonkers with it. <laughs> so like, I'm not going to go there and do this at all. So I'll take some of what he's saying and I'll, I'll follow through on like the action items I have. Um, knowing that a lot of what I feel like I'm getting here seems to be either regurgitated from some other source that wasn't attributed, uh, which isn't necessarily bad, right? But when it's point blank verbatim using the same words, it makes me like, wait, I've read that in those exact words somewhere else. What am I supposed to do with that? Like that's the question marks I start to, to get anyway. Uh, it is a great book. I, I, I'm so grateful that I've read it. It is absolutely not, I would say, the book that says, here's how you do productivity. Uh, and it's not necessarily a time management book at all. It's not necessarily, I would even say, a mind management book because I really don't know what I would do from a mind management stance having read this now. Um, so I'm going to put it at 3.5. I'm not going to go quite as high as you, Mike. But I think that there's a lot of value in this. Obviously, I've got three action items from it. But I just feel like from a book stance, there's, there's a lot that could have been done here to make it significantly better that I kind of wish they had done. So for the next one, David, please get a little more help. <laughs>
All right. Let's put this one on the shelf. What's next? So coming up next, we have The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, I believe. Um, as we were talking about beforehand, this is a really short book. You'll read it in about 30 minutes, and you'll be done. <laughs> Actually, it's the exact opposite of that. <laughs> what did we decide? It's 450 pages? Is that what it is? It's a long uh, one. I don't, I don't have the uh, Amazon listing in front of me, and the book is upstairs at the moment. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, it's ginormous and uh, really tiny print. And from what I've heard, a very polarizing book. So assuming we can get through it. Correct. <laughs> should yep. be a good conversation. <laughs> yep. So we'll see. Anyway, 48 Laws of Power. What's after that, Mike? What'd you decide? Uh, well, I'm on the fence. I kind of want to make you read some days today. Uh, at some point, but I don't think that time is is next time. So I'm actually going to pick another book that I've had for a, a while, a uh, another classic book. Uh, there is an an updated version of the 21 Laws of Leadership. So we'll keep with the number. <laughs> All right. But uh, I've read this in the the, the past, and uh, I want to read the updated version. Um, this was like one of the first books that I read when I got into, got into reading. I feel like it's going to hit me totally different this time. Leadership is a topic that I really, really enjoy. And um, I've got another one that is coming out shortly that I almost picked here instead. But I want to make sure that we have time to get it and read it prior to picking it for Bookworm. Fair enough. Just too, too close to, to release time. Yeah. So, yeah. One Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. An oldie but a goodie. Yeah, I read this one, what's that been, eight years ago now? Seven, eight years ago with a men's group. So, been through it once. I'm guessing it's not too much different, but I'm guessing also that stage of life is going to hit me very different than it did then. Yeah, and really the the purpose, um, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation also, but the big thing is I feel this is, plugging a hole in the bookworm catalog <laughs> you know i take notes when That's we true. uh when we do these episodes and we go back and we reference other episodes that we've done and other books that we've read i feel like this is one that we would probably reference often but we haven't covered it yet so yeah we should do that yep that's actually partially why i picked 48 laws of power it's like i feel like this is one that could be referenced but isn't Anyway, that'll be good. How about gap books, Mike? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I have one, 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Like, that's, <laughs> that's going to be my gap book this time around. <laughs> yeah, I actually have been reading uh, some gap books, but uh, yeah, I'm putting those on, on hold for now so I can get through this one. Yeah, that's the same boat I'm in. Despite having like an extra hour of reading at night, this one's filling all of that time. Yep. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks, everyone, who joined us live. Thank you especially to the Bookworm Club premium members who are willing to support the show financially. It really means a lot. If you want to help us keep the lights on, you can go to bookworm.fm slash membership, five bucks a month, 50 bucks a year. Gets you our undying gratitude. In addition to a couple of perks, uh, the uh, the mind node files from all the books that we read for Bookworm, uh, I take notes on those and I upload those to the club. If you are a member and you haven't been there recently, I just uploaded a bunch of them, so go check those out. There's also a 4K wallpaper uh, with the Bookworm logo and some gap book episodes that Joe did back in the day. So uh, yeah, bookworm.fm slash membership if any of that sounds appealing to you or you just want to help support the show. And we don't talk about it a whole lot, but, you know, with Christmas coming soon, if you want a gift, the Bookworm sweatshirts are amazing. Like, I have one that I wear, like, all the time. If I need a sweatshirt that I know is going to be warm, like, that's the one I grab every single time. Like, I love that thing. So, yes, you need you need to pick up a sweatshirt. Like, it's, it's the go-to, for sure. It's my favorite. So, anyway. True. If you are someone who's reading along with us, pick up The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Read every lunch break. Read every time uh, you have a chance before you go to bed. Read every morning when you get up, at least an hour at each one of those, and you might get done in time. And uh, 
we'll, we'll cover that one with you in a couple of weeks. Oh, that is not oh. wrong. <laughs> no, it's not wrong. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I see the talent code, Blake. I see you recommended that in the club. Thank you for doing that. I almost grabbed that one. Um, to be honest, though, I'm more interested in the culture code by the same person, I believe. Who's that by? Dan. I'll have to look. Starts with a C. That's all I remember. Code? Daniel Coyle. C O Y L E. I don't know what those I've heard of those, but I don't know what they are. They have like talking about talent and talking about culture, I assume. <laughs> I assume. I assume. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I don't think we've done a Daniel Coyle book. We'll have to have to do that. Cool, cool. All right, should we pick another time? Let's do it. I guess that would be December 15th, right? Uh, let's see. One, two. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Ba, 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 ba. Two o'clock. Let's do it. Two o'clock, 15th. You should get that soon. <laughs> All right. All right. Anything else before we go? That's all I got. Cool. All right. Thanks, team, for joining us today. See you in a couple weeks.